Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be going through these Ladybird books here, and uh, basically I'm going to be reviewing each one as I go along, and then at the end I'm going to give you uh, my overall list from best to worst. Or should we do, let's do worst to best, why not? Uh, so there are, I think, what, nine of these? Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven of these. Uh, I bought these online, uh, so I think I spent about £8.40 on these uh, and I got them as a job lot. Um, basically because I'm running my eBay store where I'm like downsizing and selling a lot of my old books, but I realised there's actually quite a lot of room for me to profit by buying job lots like these and then selling them on, because I can probably sell, well I'll list these as 2 99 each as a minimum, um, including postage. Uh, so they'll make a pound, prof a pound each basically from the listing. Uh, some of them might be worth more as well, so we'll see as we go. But assuming that's right, then by my maths, I've made like, I don't know, a fiver on this lot, basically. Uh, assuming they all sell, which they might not. But my goal really is to like buy stuff that I'm interested in, uh, assuming that then other people might be interested in. So I might have some more videos like this where I buy a job lot of books and I tell you what I think of them, you know? Uh, and then, yeah, these will all be for sale in my eBay store, which is linked below. I've always enjoyed uh, Ladybird books in general and try and pick them out at charity shops. Actually, even in charity shops, they're normally like £2 each, so by buying these in bulk, I've kind of uh, saved a bit of cash there. So yeah, uh, so the Ladybird books we have here, and uh, this footage may seem familiar because this is also what I've used in my haul. Have a go. Uh, the Ladybird Keyworks Reading Scheme, this is book 2B. A Ladybird Learning to Read book, Telling the Time, this is by M.E. Gag, N.F.U. That's a lot of letters. Fun at the Farm 4B, the Ladybird Keywords Reading Scheme. This goes together with the early one. Mr. Noah's Animals, The Monkeys and the Foxes, Storyboard. Learning with Mother, the Ladybird Under 5 series, book 4. A Ladybird 4th Picture Book. We have Tasseltip Plays Truant, which I think is like the only fiction one of these, really. Learning with Traditional Rhymes, Dancing Rhymes. Uh, uh, here we have two that I'm really excited to get to. So a first Did You Know book, Ladybird's Words, Easy Readers book three. <laughs> and a third Did You Know book, the Ladybird Keywords, Easy Readers book five. And also, number uh, 5A, where we go, the Ladybird Keywords Reading Scheme. So a lot of these go together in little series as well. So I'm keen to see what I make of these. So now let's cut to um, what I thought of each of the individual books, and then at the end we're going to do this rating from worst to best. Okay, the footage that follows is all from my uh, wrap-up. So the footage basically is going to be used for both my wrap-up and for my Ladybird books mini wrap-up I guess uh, but obviously my monthly wrap-up has all of my other books in the ladybird one will have a ranking as well so this is have a go 2b and this is by W Murray basically the point of these books is to teach kids to read through repetition uh, so there's actually the the information I really quite liked uh, was at the start and at the end I'm gonna read some of that uh, in a second so uh, W Murray the author of the ladybird keywords reading scheme is an experienced headmaster author and lecturer the teaching of reading. He is a co-author with Jay McNally of Keywords to Literacy, a teacher's book published by the Schoolmaster Publishing Co Limited. And so um, it's very much like, so you want fun, I want fun. This is fun. I don't think it is fun, mate. You've, he's catching a boot. He's fishing and he's caught a boot. This is Pat. I like Pat. Pat likes fun. We like this dog. So down here it's teaching us for some reason it's teaching us Pat. Why is it teaching us Pat? Okay, that's really odd that it's teaching us Pat because if you look at um, what it's about here, it says, uh, some of the words in the English language are used much more frequently than others. These words, which are, these words which appear more frequently can be called keywords. Research shows that 12 of these keywords make up one quarter of all those we read and write. 100 of them form half and 300 about three quarters of the total number of words found in juvenile reading. Reading skill is accelerated if these important words are learned early and in a pleasant way. You're not telling me that Pat is one of the 300 most common words in the English language, especially because it's capitalised, as in like, Postman Pat. But yeah, and then at the end we have a list of words used in this book, total number of new words, 27, and again it says now use book 2C, so you're actually meant to read 2A first, and that introduces the words, and then 2B kind of repeats them, so we've got number of new words in this book, 27, all the 16 words from book 1B are also included, 
Average repetition per word, nine. Capital letters new to this book in order of appearance, W. Y W L C S N. It's got like inverted commas are not introduced at this early stage of reading. They are brought into use in book 4B. I just think it's fascinating how much like attention to detail they've gone into there. And like that, those stats at the end, really cool. So I gave this a four out of five. I just thought it was uh, like, it's a nice idea and I think well executed. Although the problem being you, you really need all of the books in the series for it to work. But then I can understand why they would do that. Because from a marketing point of view, that's going to sell more books. So yeah, four out of five. All right, then we're going to go for where we go, and uh, this is another one of the Ladybird keywords reading scheme books, again by W. Murray, and uh, this one used to belong to Lorraine, apparently, so shout out to Lorraine. Uh, this one, you can tell this is further along the series, like uh, even if you just look at the pages, the amount of text on them, um, they're a lot denser, but they do still have this feel like, and they're deliberately written in this way, to use repetitive language in a way to kind of drum the words home into the reader but it also makes it feel a little bit like they're um, like um, n like not a foreign language speaker um, just because normally in English or in any language I imagine the words you choose naturally vary so if you're talking about your job you'd also talk about your work what you do for a living like you'd put it in lots of different ways just naturally as you talk about it whereas this is like constantly we do this we do that uh, it's also got this bit of page missing so I had to guess what part of it meant. But uh, yeah, it was pretty good. <laughs> I'm gonna read uh, I'm gonna read your sample page. We've got the illustration here. The illustrations are very good. They've clearly been like commissioned specifically for these stories, which I think is quite cool. But uh, so yeah, look, says Peter to his sister. What is this? Read all about it, says the man. Read all about it. Peter knows how to read. He reads Big Fire this afternoon. We saw the fireman go, says Jane to her brother. We saw them from the bus. The men know how to put a fire out. They will have put it out by now. Peter says to his sister, I can read some more. Look, it says danger, men at work. He reads it again to his daddy and Jane reads to her mummy. Daddy says, it is good that our children know how to read. Um, but this happened as well, by the way. They were on a bus and they saw this fire happening and then they get off the bus and they walk past their school and then there's someone selling newspapers about the reporting on the fire. And I'm like, but didn't, that wouldn't, they wouldn't have gone to print that quickly. Uh, but yeah, I gave it like a 3.5 out of 5, it was alright. Then we have a first Do You Know book. Uh, the Ladybird Keywords Easy Readers book 3. And again, this is by W. Murray. So here we have um, a little bit about the blue whale. Uh, so these are all like facts basically. They're not really facts, they're more things that you can learn about. Um, but I, I just chuckled at the way this was written. And again, because this is the first Did You Know book, I think the language is a bit simpler than it is in the later one. This is not pond water, this is the sea, and a living thing from the sea. It is something large, something very, very large. It is a blue whale. This large blue whale jumps from the water. The men in the boat are in danger from the whale. Here you have a very fat man. The man in the picture is very large, as you can see. He is too large to run fast, and too large to jump. He is too big for climbing mountains and for diving. You are not as big as this. You can run and jump and dive and climb. Uh, here we get this guy jumping out of a plane and we have a few pages here that all link together and uh, it says the longest drop from the greatest height was made on August 16th 1960 by US Air Force Captain J.W. Kittinger DFC but of course like that's been uh, superseded by Felix Baumgartner and again we have here uh, the Empire State Building in New York and it says this is a very tall building there are many other very tall buildings in the world as you know this building is the tallest the tallest of them all it is the tallest of this kind of building in the world did you know this in this building, it is a very long way from the bottom to the top. But it's not, obviously, because of the Burj Khalifa. And here we have uh, the Rafflesia Arnoldi, the largest flower in the world, measures three feet across. It is found in Sumatra. Although beautiful to look at, it has an unpleasant smell. Now prepare yourself for this. If you have trypophobia, look away, because it's this bad boy, which you may have seen photos of. Uh, I quite enjoyed this, 3.75 out of 5. Here we have a third Did You Know book. So this one's aimed at an older audience. Here we have the Pyramids of Egypt. The great pyramids in the picture are pyramid. Some very large pyramids are to be found in Egypt. They were made many, many years ago. Some were made about 5,000 years ago. They are high, but people can climb to the top. The pyramids were made for the kings of Egypt. After the kings were dead, their remains were put inside the pyramids. Some of their things were put in with them. Many of these were made of gold. Thousands of men had to work for many years building the pyramids in Egypt. I love the pyramids and Egypt history. 
And then we have, uh, it's talking about the pyramids in Giza. And then we get Giza's. This Giza is in Wairakeri in New, New Zealand's North Island. The water is boiling hot. I just thought that was like a nice subtle little link. But could be confusing, I guess, to kids when you're trying to teach them the language to this. Uh, here we have the Eiffel Tower. Uh, which I'll read out the section on. The Eiffel Tower is one of the most well-known landmarks in the world. In the tower is a wireless transmitting station. Before television towers were made, the tallest tower in the world was the Eiffel Tower in Paris. Paris is in France. When in Paris, everyone goes to see the Eiffel Tower before they go back to their own country. The Eiffel Tower is much higher than the largest pyramid. Some people like to go right up to the top in the lift. From there they can see all Paris. The lift works by electricity. The Eiffel Tower is made of metal and is very strong. In the picture you can see the Eiffel Tower. It had to be the shape because it is so high. Men were at work for two years building it. Here we go, uh, This I just want to show you this map here. This map shows where the Sargasso Sea is in the Atlantic Ocean and the direction that eels swim to rivers in England and Europe. Uh, and I've always wondered, because I read wide Sargasso Sea not long ago and like, I'm, I'm just bad. Well, I, I can't read, like, ge like ge ge I can't read ge uh, geography stuff. I can't say the sentence. I can't read geography stuff and picture it very well, so it helps to have a map, like, I don't know, it's only recently that I've even learned, like, what's on the west coast and what's on the east coast of the US, for example. We have bees. And this goes, uh, bees are insects. They make a humming sound with their wings as they fly from flower to flower. Bees look for pollen and nectar in flowers. They fly to their hives with this pollen and nectar. In the hives, the nectar is used to make honey. Bees live on honey. Many people like to eat the honey made by bees. Bees eat the pollen they get from flowers. It helps them to grow. Not all bees live in man-made hives. Sometimes bees will make a nest in a tree, or a nest can be found in a hole in a building. Yes, not all bees live in man-made hives. As though people thought that bees live, over, like, you know what I mean? As though people think that bees have always lived in hives that men have built. As though people didn't get the idea to build hives because of hives. <laughs> Um, yeah, and then we get some pictures at the end, and I'm just going to read this page because this basically gives you all of the facts that you could learn from this book. Can you read the words when you cover the pictures? The moon is nearer the earth than the sun. Here is the fossil of a fish. These are the pyramids of Egypt. A geezer blows out steam and water. Mother of pearl can be seen in an oyster. Gold is very valuable. A car uses petrol and oil. A rig is used to get oil from under the sea. We heat chalk and clay to make cement. Sand, gravel, cement and water make concrete. The Eiffel Tower is in Paris, France. The longest railway tunnel is in Italy and Switzerland. A hovercraft can move over the sea. Dolphins like to play games. Some eels swim for three years to reach Europe. Some hummingbirds are very small. The ostrich has wings but cannot fly. Bats sleep in the day and fly at night. Bees get nectar to make honey. And radar helps men to fly aeroplanes. So yeah, did enjoy this one. I'll probably enjoy this one more than the first one in this little series. I gave this one a 4 out of 5. So here we have a ladybird learning to read book, telling the time. And somebody, the previous owner, has helpfully scrawled 8 o'clock here. And they're correct. So kudos to that. Um, pretty basic book. And it, the premise is it goes through like a day in the life of a child, I guess. So, you know, at 8 o'clock we have our breakfast. Some of them I disagreed with slightly. <laughs> Well, some of them are very specific as well. At 12 o'clock, mummy cooks the dinner. No, she doesn't. She cooks lunch. At 1 o'clock, we have our dinner. No, you don't. You have your lunch. At 4 o'clock, we have our tea. I mean, I guess, actually, they are having tea, like afternoon tea, as opposed to dinner, you know? Um, but, like, where are some of the specific ones? Like, where was the uh, boat one? I think it was at 3 o'clock. At three o'clock, we sail our boats. Quite specific. Um, but yeah, I can see why this would be useful if you were learning to tell the time. Uh, I mean, 3.5 out of five for what it is. This one was by M.E. Gag, by the way. Here we have Mr. Noah's Animals, the monkeys and the foxes. And so this is part of a series, the Mr. Noah's Animals series. There's a little story. It's actually two stories in one. Um, obviously, it's biblical and, and Bible inspired, which, I mean, I'm not exactly religious, so I, I didn't particularly care for that side but also we have this bit here Mr. Noah went to look and he saw the two snakes the snakes were like a rope the monkey went up and down to get the water I'm not convinced that two snakes could support the weight of a monkey carrying a bucket of water but maybe I'm wrong I don't know we'd have to carry out some experiments and then I got really obsessed with this one with these I don't know if you can see them 
these little boys look, or little, um, oh, what would you call them, like life rings or whatever, life preservers, um, and they have Noah's Ark written on them. But basically, the places where, the, where it's written change from story to story. Here we have a little title page for the foxes. I like the colour of this. Um, so yeah, look, now the, now the writing has changed position. And in fact, I believe, yeah, if you compare the two pictures, it's in this, <laughs> it changes from frame to frame. And then here we have in this bottom one, one of them is missing the apostrophe, and the other one does have the apostrophe, but it's written on the water instead of on the, the buoyancy ring. But uh, yeah, I did enjoy this one. Probably like a 3.75 out of 5. It would have been a 4 out of 5 if not for the religious-y stuff. But then how would you write a Noah's Ark story without it being religious? Um, I guess if they found some other way to do it that didn't have those religious undertones to it. And just had this information and this kind of quality of writing and illustration. Uh, it probably would have been a 4 for me. This one is Learning with Mother, the Ladybird Under 5 series. And this is written by Ethel and Harry Wingfield. And um, this one's strange because it's, it's written specifically for parents as well. Uh, so it's quite dense in places. So for example, here we have um, a guide to joining the library. And they say in this, um, school at five may be much too late for an effective introduction to books, which I agree with. I was reading like way before we went to school. And then I remember that at school, they made us learn the alphabet as a, b, k, d. And I already knew it as a, b, c, d. And they said the way I'd learned it was wrong. So I had to relearn the alphabet, and then relearn the original alphabet that I'd first learned. It was, uh, anyway. So we have this bit on dressing up here, I'm going to read this section out. Probably mother and father will be drawn into the pretense. They should, of course, play along with it, for in this way children prove and exercise their power of original thought, their main tool for learning and progress. At this age, fact and fancy may be equally real to a child, and it would be wise to be a little permissive about this. It is usually an indication of the struggle between the enormous world of reality surging in on them and their own private world of fantasy to which they turn for relief and satisfaction. We think out our problems, children play them out. Here we have a section on building up and using bricks and this reads so much like an advert. And also this company is named after HG Wells strangely, but li listen to this. The satisfying solidarity of the wood, the ease of construction, the adaptability to other tools such as model cars or animals, all these challenge creativity. A collapse just means that the bricks can be built into something new. Unlike so much of the flimsy mechanical gadgetry at present offered for sale and which some childish mishap mobilises for good. Shown in the illustration are the HG Wells bricks sold by Paul and Marjorie Abbott Limited of 74 Wigmore Street, London, W1. It also, I don't know, I kind of, uh, I miss those days when all the companies were limited companies, you know, run by families. Uh, it was simpler times. There's a van outside. Here you have some instructions on making homemade play scales. These instructions are insane. You will need one wooden coat hanger with metal hook removed, one empty cardboard cylinder about 12 inches to 15 inches long, two identical empty plastic cartons, two equal pieces of string about 14 inches long, one three inch nail or a little longer than the width of a cylinder, a five or six inch circle of stout paper, a gimlet, <laughs> there wasn't he in the fellowship of the ring, several weighty pebbles, one hair grip and sellotape. And then we have learning to sew here, and, and this I think is a really good tip. Give a child some old greeting cards, a fairly big nail, a hammer, or maybe maybe don't give a child a hammer, and an undersurface of thick card or a piece of wood to work on, and let her or him first punch the holes. Uh, I think more what I thought was a good idea is where they say card is the best material for the first sewing lesson. Small hands find sewing on flimsy cloth so difficult that this skill is often needlessly left unmastered until school age. I don't know man, I... I, I still can't really sew. I can only just sew. Well, I sewed my guitar strap and it took me an hour. It took half an hour of just trying to get the thread through the needle. Anyway, Learning With Mother, uh, book number four in this series. I gave that one like a 3.5 out of 5. I thought it was, again, it was good for what it is. Here we have a Ladybird fourth picture book. And the idea here is it can show you some pictures and teach you some stuff. And uh, you can, you can you know, learn to read and learn about stuff at the same time. I did think it was funny that one of them is potatoes. A picture book with potatoes in and uh, we've got talking about potatoes and I just feel like they could have said to boil and mash them stick them in a stew but obviously this predates Lord of the Rings didn't it uh, umbrella talking about an umbrella this little girl has her umbrella up so she will not get wet in the rain she will stay dry what color is your mother's umbrella I have no idea what color my mum's umbrella is in fact when I saw this it reminded me I've got a messenger and ask her I'm gonna ask her just out of the blue and see what she says now mirror Talking about a mirror, what do you see when you look into your mirror? 
disappointment and broken dreams. Uh, so yeah, this one probably more 3.25, 3.5 out of 5 maybe. Uh, there's not that much to it. I mean, obviously it's a picture book. I do like the idea that it comes with these little prompts though, so that you can discuss things with your kids, you know? Okay, so then we have Tassel Tip Plays Truant, and uh, there are a few of these Tassel Tip stories. Um, I really like this actually. I like the way this map is done. Um, so, you know, you quite often get maps in stories, but the way the places are labelled, it's not like these are the fields, it's like uh, they gathered flowers here. This is the hill they whizzed down. I just thought that was a nice little uh, addition. Story by Sarah Cotton. Now, I'm not actually a particular fan of like fairy tale style stories. This kind of does have that. It has a range of different animals. Um, and this kind of does that sort of thing. It has a range of different animals that all go to school together and they decide to play truant. And uh, this follows what happens when they do that. Um, and then the teacher finds them in the, in the forest and I'm like, well, why wasn't the teacher at school? I guess maybe he was looking at them. It's not really clear how much time passed. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I actually quite enjoyed this one. I thought I thought gave this one like a four out of five. I think the storytelling, uh, the way it was written, and the images all came together really well, just to make a nice little children's book, you know. Then we have learning with traditional rhymes, dancing rhymes. Now, unfortunately, this this is part of a series that includes finger rhymes, number rhymes, memory rhymes, talking rhymes, action rhymes, and dancing rhymes. I'm not really one for um, dancing rhymes or action rhymes really like the memory rhyme sounds interesting because it's always like you know remember remember the 5th of November and all these mnemonics and stuff but uh, yeah it's cool because it's got like the uh, sheet music for them as well so I'm gonna give you this example here did you ever see a lassie did you ever see a lassie a lassie a lassie did you ever see a lassie go this way and that go this way and that way and this way and that way did you ever see a lassie go this way and that it's got a uh, verse 1 one child performs an action in center of ring whilst other children watch Verse 2, everyone imitates her action. The word laddie can be substituted for lassie throughout this rhyme. Uh, you got you, you put your left arm out, which is actually the hokey gokey. And the lyrics to this are different to the ones I know as well. You put your left arm out, your left arm in. Left arm out and shake it all about. You do the cokey cokey and turn around. That's what it's all about. I'll do the cokey cokey. I'll do the cokey cokey. I'll do the cokey cokey. Knees bend, arm stretch, rah, rah, rah. You put your right arm out, your right arm in, etc. I'll do the cokey cokey, etc. You put your left leg out, etc. I'll do the cokey cokey, etc. Fair enough. And yeah, here we have the other one. So this is the one that I like the sound of. Memory Rhymes, book three. A diverse collection of rhymes mainly concerned with days of the week, months of the year, points of the compass, and letters of the alphabet. With these, a child learns simple progressions in an amusing and absorbing manner. Overall, I'd probably give this one a three out of five. I think it's my least favourite of the lot. It's alright at what it does. Even then, the kind of the instructions to do the dances and stuff are... I don't know, they're difficult to follow at times, but as I say, it's, it's just not really for me that kind of uh, poetry, I guess. And finally, Fun at the Farm 4B. So again, uh, this is kind of a higher level than like, uh, level 2, lower than level 5. We have a danger sign in this. Look, danger, says Jane. It says danger. Keep away, Peter, she says. Do not go there. And um, I just think it's interesting because danger is one of the like 300 odd words or whatever that they use repeatedly throughout this. But that one seems to me to be a really good word to teach kids, as opposed to Pat, for example. No one needs to know Pat. And I think it's very very typical of the time we're talking about here. Daddy reads and Mummy works. Yeah, he's reading the paper and she's feeding the kids. So uh, yeah, this one's like 3.75 out of 5. It was alright. So that brings us to these from order from least favourite to favourite. So, I'm just going to read these out from least favourite to favourite. Obviously, I don't really need to summarise them because I've already done that here. But uh, So, least favourite. Dancing rhymes, learning with traditional rhymes, followed by telling the time, a ladybird fourth picture book, have a go, to be, of the ladybird keywords reading scheme, learning with mother, book four in the ladybird under five series, fun at the farm, 4B, from the ladybird keywords reading scheme, where we go, 5A, from the ladybird keywords reading scheme, scheme. Tassel tip plays truant. And then we've got our top three here. Uh, now, probably no real surprise. Mr. Noah's Animals, The Monkeys and the Foxes. A first Did You Know book and a third Did You Know book. But I'm biased because I like facts. So there, there we have it. So there we have it. That's what I thought of this little pile of uh, Ladybird books. As always, don't forget to let me know what you thought in the comments. Let me know if you've ever read any of the Ladybird books and uh, if so, which ones. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more. And I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.